So, been a couple of weeks, but we're going to find ourselves again in the book of Acts today. So why don't you grab your cup of coffee, and most importantly, by the way, your Bible, which I'm sure is near at hand, hopefully it is, and we're going to uh, move into Acts chapter 17. Last time we were together in the book of Acts a couple of weeks ago, we finished Acts 16, where Paul and Silas uh, went to uh, Philippi and were arrested for preaching the gospel and, 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 and thrown into jail. And whereas, you know, probably a lot of people would have seen that as sort of a, a, you know, putting a kibosh on the ministry. In fact, it became the launching pad for the ministry as they led this Philippian jailer and his entire family to Christ. Uh, and so after that episode, they go and they stay with Lydia a little bit. And then in Acts chapter 17, the Holy Spirit begins to direct them to go on to another area, namely that of Thessalonica. And so in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, starting in verse 1, uh, let me just read the first few verses here and then take a moment to, to look at what's going on. <clears throat> so chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, but not and, and also not a few of the leading women. So here they arrive in Thessalonica. They've come from Philippi. They have... Um, now arrived in this new place, and as was Paul's custom, he went into the synagogue and began to minister to the Jews there in the synagogue. Now, I, I, I want to stop there for just a moment because there is, um, you know, there's a lot made of the idea uh, that we're in Romans where Paul speaks about how he is the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter, on the other hand, we see uh, pointed out as being the apostle to the circumcision. Now, those distinctions have become the basis of, of some theology uh, around the idea of, uh, of dispensationalism, which, by the way, I, I, I am at least dispensational enough in recognizing the difference between Israel and the church and, and these distinctions that they have and, and all of that. However, when it comes to the people of Paul and Peter, um, we see that, you know, on the one hand, there's certainly, you know, Paul was telling the truth when he talked about his particular focus of ministry as opposed to Peter's. But that didn't mean that their ministries did not overlap into other uh, people groups. For example, as we're seeing right here, um, you know, Paul, as was his custom, as he regularly did when he came to a city, um, he would go into the synagogue and preach, uh, preach Christ. Uh, well, who was in the synagogue but Jews? And so, um, you know, we see his own burden for his countrymen in Romans chapter 9 through 11, uh, how he'd be willing to even give up his own salvation if it would guarantee the salvation of his countrymen according to the flesh. Uh, so Paul's desire, and not just desire, but actual ministry to the Jews didn't cease, even though his particular focus was more to the Gentiles. Um, so, um, you know, when you see this kind of a thing, it's, I guess I just bring it up to say that while there is definitely some substance to some of the theological perspectives that we develop based on these kinds of things, we should also recognize that sometimes these ideas are not as clear-cut or as cleanly separated uh, as we might want them to be or as sometimes they're purported to be. Um, we recognize, um, you know, and I almost wonder if there's sort of this sort of preemptive undermining of some of our uh, presuppositions by the Holy Spirit. For example, Peter opens the door to the Gentiles, even though, or uh, to the Gentiles, yes, in Acts chapter 10, even though Paul would become the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, Paul, although he's the apostle of the Gentiles, goes to the synagogue incessantly. He just refuses to give up on his countrymen and just focus on the Gentiles. But we do see, uh, as a matter of fact, when Paul is called by the Lord, um, and, uh, and Ananias takes him in and prays over him where the scales uh, uh, leave his eyes after he's blinded on that road to Dam uh, Damascus when he meets with the Lord. Um, the Lord tells Ananias that Paul's ministry is going to be both to the Jews and the Gentiles. And so Paul recognizes a particular focus in his ministry, but really Paul has a ministry to both uh, by the testimony of the Lord himself. And so here we see not only his going out to speak to the Jews in the synagogues, but actually some of the Gentiles come to believe as well. And so there's this uh, wonderfully expansive ministry of Paul's even though, again, he, he does have a particular focus, it doesn't mean that he doesn't minister to the other 
uh, the other people group, the Gentile, the Jews and that. So that being said, another thing I'll point out from this passage is that we'll find that Paul is only in Thessalonica for about three weeks. Over three Sabbaths, he preaches Christ and people get saved. And then he's going to, we'll see he and Silas are ultimately kind of have to leave town. They're only there for about three weeks. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, in that three-week period of time, they plant the church in Thessalonica and establish them in the faith. And we realize that they actually, in establishing them in the faith, covered a lot of ground with them. How do we know this? Because when we read First and Second Thessalonians, letters that Paul wrote to this church after he left them, we find that he is answering some pretty profound, deep theological questions, especially in regard to things like the end times and the rise of Antichrist and the rapture of the church and these kinds of things. These are pretty sophisticated questions and Paul gives some pretty sophisticated answers uh, that give us a lot of illumination as to you know what's going on during that period of time that is coming. And, uh, and, and I, I say that because um, in talking about those kinds of topics, it's significant to me that in planting this church and really only having about three weeks worth of time to invest in them, he spent time in, in that three-week span talking about those kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes we consider eschatology sort of um, a topic for more mature believers, you know, to get into and that kind of thing because there's so much digging into the scripture and trying to see what's going on and piecing together, connecting the dots and that kind of thing. Paul apparently didn't feel like that was something for believers later on. As a matter of fact, he taught young believers, new believers, these ideas. And they had questions about it, and they asked him about it. Well, they felt they were under uh, maybe the Antichrist persecution in that time. What happened to the, about, you know, what about those who passed away before Jesus came for us? Well, those were deep questions and important questions that Paul apparently had spoken to somewhat and then goes back and reminds them of the things he talked about and goes on and explains uh, what some of those things were that he had shared with them. So um, eschatology, uh, not only a part of a well-balanced Christian diet in terms of their study of Scripture, but also not something that needs to be avoided in the lives of young believers, new believers. We can share these things with them. And why wouldn't we? As Paul says twice within the span of about nine verses, he talks about how these things are intended to be an encouragement to one another. And we're supposed to encourage one another by sharing these things and reminding each other of the fact that the Lord is coming for us. So good, good stuff. And that's there in Thessalonica. So we see that uh, many of the Jews were, uh, some of the Jews were persuaded in the synagogue. It was many of the devout Greeks and also not a few of the leading women. It uh, goes on, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, <clears throat> set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Jason apparently having sort of partnered with them and taken them in. Now, when it says the Jews got upset with them and, and, and were jealous and put together a mob to come against them in that, um, <clears throat> what is in view there is, you know, leading Jews, Jews who are influenced by them, those who are of the faith of Israel, uh, believing in Father Abraham, the law of Moses, all these kinds of things, feeling like there is an affront against their faith because Jesus as Messiah is being preached. Okay, So there is an animosity immediately that was not just limited to them, but also we see a group called the Judaizers throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts and on, who follow Paul around and try and undermine the teaching that he's giving about Christ as Messiah, salvation by grace through faith as opposed to the law. These things that not only Paul is preaching, but that were ultimately uh, come, uh, came to an understanding in the council at Jerusalem in, uh, in Acts chapter 15, which we covered some time back. So whenever Paul went to speak and preach the gospel to the Jews, there was this animosity about Christ as Messiah. Why? Well, because two, at least twofold. One, because Israel crucified her Messiah. And so the idea of our religious leaders having put to death the one we've been waiting for was something that was a hard sell. Secondly, the idea that in Christ's coming, and as Jesus himself said, having come to fulfill the law, having fulfilled it now, we understand that no one was ever saved by the law. How could we be? Therefore, Christ came to save us from the penalty of, of the broken law. And now by faith in what he accomplished, we're saved. Faith in him who accomplished it. Well, that message was also a hard sell because as was decided and understood at the Council of Jerusalem, 
people didn't need to come through the law of Moses to be right with God anymore. And so, uh, not that they ever were. Again, we've covered this many, many times. No one's ever been right by the law of God because no one could keep it. And so, in Christ's coming, this suddenly changed the whole message. It wasn't like, come and become a proselyte to Judaism. It was come by faith and put your trust in Christ and be saved by the grace of God. Well, that that was met immediately by an affront by the jealousy of those who were holding on to the law of Moses. But we should also recognize, too, that under undergirding that animosity is also uh, the enemy wanting to make sure that message does not go forth. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying these people are demon-possessed or something. I'm just saying that there is a desire on Satan's part to keep people from coming to recognize the truth of the fulfillment of what Christ accomplished. And so therefore, everywhere Paul would go, he would be met by uh, uh, animosity, antagonization, uh, opposition. He'd be thrown in jail. He'd be beaten. He'd be ridiculed. He'd be mocked. He'd be uh, all these different things for the sake of the gospel. But so important is that message that it is worth and was worth to him. Uh, all that came upon him, light afflictions as he would call it, for the sake of the gospel. And so um, these folks here, these uh, Jews who are really just still holding on to the law of Moses and and and, and still in rejection of their Messiah, uh, gathered together uh, a mob from the rabble and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house again of Jason in verse 5, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So they can't find Paul and Silas, but they do find Jason and a couple of other men, and they drag them out and bring them before the authorities. And they accuse them of something that I would wish we could all be accused of. These men who are turning the world upside down. Okay? Word had come of the power of the gospel in other places, and now it had come here to Thessalonica. And having been met with opposition, they now accused them of turning the world upside down. Truth of the matter is, they weren't turning the world upside down. They were bringing a message that actually would set hearts right, uh, and even right side up, if I can follow the illustration the other way. But um, that is exactly what the gospel does. It takes a world that is actually already upside down, backwards, sideways, every direction except the way it should be, and it brings clarity, it brings light, it brings salvation, it brings a change of heart and a change of life, a change of destiny and a change of, a change of approach to space and time today. The gospel has the power to ultimately and completely and totally pervasively make someone brand new in Christ, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5. And so this message has power, and that power is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And so the ambassadors for Christ, again, as Paul would say, uh, who bring this message are going to be coming into hostile territory literally pretty much everywhere we would go in this world that is not already a place where believers have set up camp. Um, The world is not a place that we are called to make friends with, to build uh, you know, to, to build our futures in, we're supposed to always recognize that this is the enemy's territory and we're knee deep into it. You know, we've, when we came to Christ, we crossed into the battle line, uh, the, you know, the, the, the DMZ, we're, we're on the other side of it now, we're, we're in it. And we need to recognize that and remember that, that we are citizens of heaven, ambassadors for Christ, called uh, soldiers for Christ. We are running a race to win. We are, we are called into this. And so therefore, Paul, of course, recognizing it and telling us all these things, um, lived that out. And so as, as, as they went there and brought this message, the whole city became in an uproar in response to it. And so Jason and the other men uh, who took the heat for it, um, you know, were also apparently devoted uh, as well. They received Paul and, and Silas, and they, they went there and they, they suffered alongside of him. Now, Paul and Silas here were not found by the crowd. Um, They ultimately are going to be led out of the city and to go on to another spot. But uh, suffice to say that there was um, sort of a a fellowship of sufferings that was going on here with Jason and those with him, um, involved in the part that they played in supporting Paul and Silas in the ministry that they were doing, and they also paid a price for that. 
Um, we should recognize that whatever part we play in ministry, whether we're the mouthpiece or whether we're helping support the mouthpiece, uh, whether the missionary or the one supporting the missionary, whatever we're doing the work directly hands-on or whether we're upholding the arms of those who are doing it, um, whatever part we play is meaningful to the Lord and is also a target for Satan. Um, we should never feel as though whatever ministry we are doing, if it's not maybe the upfront one or something like that, that somehow it's less valid or less important. The most important ministry for you is the one God has put on your shoulders to do, the one he's called you to, uh, that work he's called you to put your hand on the plow toward. And so um, so recognize it as that. It's no small thing. And matter of fact, it's in those things oftentimes that God gives you skills and puts tools in your toolbox to then move you into some other place where he can use you in, in some way there with the experiences and things that you've learned. Your increased faith and trust in him in the previous circumstance now comes to bear in the new circumstance. Uh, and you find that throughout the course of your Christian life, God is putting you in different places and different opportunities to do different kinds of things. But each one of them becomes kind of a training and proving ground for you uh, ultimately, as, as he uses you for other things. Um, there's this uh, passage, I, I, oh, I, I escapes me where it is, uh, but it speaks of the idea of not despising the days of small things. You know, we, 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 we categorize ministry and think that something is up here and something else is down here. Again, the best ministry for you is the one God has called you to, just like the best ministry for me is the one he's called me to. Um, I remember for the longest time feeling like, boy, if I could be an evangelist, that would be the thing. If I could go out on, uh, and I had a friend who totally had the gift of evangelist and, and evangelism, and we would go out and and we would both talk to people, but he would always be leading people to Christ, and I practically never was. It just wasn't I didn't want to, it wasn't I didn't have the gospel or whatever, but just he just clearly had God's hand on him for that ministry. And I always admired it very, very much, and I, I still kind of do, although I recognize my own calling now. But um, there's really just something so frontline about that that I just so deeply admire. Um, but that's just not what God had for me. He had something different for me. And so we should never look at ministry, uh, certain kinds of ministry as being, well, if I was just doing that, I would be doing something meaningful for God. Hey, you know something? Stephen was waiting on tables, and God ultimately used that. And God used that opportunity to put him in a situation where he ultimately would be martyred for his faith from a waiter to a martyr in like the space of, you know, just a few verses, basically. So don't ever think of anything as, as like where you are. Don't think of that as a, as a place that is somehow meaningless to God. It's actually very likely extreme, very likely it is absolutely very meaningful to God. Your obedience is what he's asking for. So let him put you where he will and move you as he will. So that being said, let me finish up verse uh, uh, eight and nine, and uh, we'll probably stop there for today. But uh, and the people and the city authorities were distributing, uh, or were disturbed, distributing, were disturbed when they had heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And so this uprising kind of dies down as, as some, um, um, I don't know if what's to be read into that as a bribe or just sort of paying a fee or penalty or something like that. But eventually the, 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 the um, uproar kind of died down. They let Jason and them go. So I'm going to stop there for today. We'll pick up where they go next in next episode. But um, you know, if you have any thoughts or questions or anything like that on what we talk about, what we cover, or for that matter, anything, every now and then we try to take some of those questions and, uh, and address them in a podcast in an episode. We did some of that over the last week or so, a couple of weeks really. And um, so uh, we'll continue to do those things. But again, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, you can feel free to leave them here on our YouTube channel or on my website at parsonspad.com. You can email me from there as well. You can watch these videos there. You can also subscribe to the audio version of this podcast. And, um, and of course, if you want to come visit us on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, our, our information about our church can be found at calvarychapelfranklin.com. So thanks for watching, and may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace forever. And how we ask for that, Lord, that, Father, you would put your hand upon us, bless us that way, that we would have peace forever. We know one day, practically, literally, we will experience your peace in a way that is completely unencumbered, unhindered, uh, unsquelched in any way when we stand in your presence. But you invite us to experience your peace even now. And so I pray that you would give us that, especially in the midst of serving you. When we face opposition and difficulty, help us to remember that we're there because you've called us to be there and you are using us in that time. And sometimes you'll deliver us from it and we'll 
uh, walk away unscathed. In some cases, though, we recognize that you call us to places uh, where we glorify you through suffering. And so whatever the case might be, help us to be willing and ready servants, recognizing that the gospel is worth it, uh, bringing people into a deeper knowledge of who you are, coming to faith in Christ and having their eternities altered is worth discomfort and, and, and even, even persecution in our day. Give us hearts and minds that are prepared and ready to dive in as you'd have us to, following obediently as you'd lead. Thank you, Father. We love you, we praise you, and ask that you continue to bless our times together as we open your word and as we seek to grow in our own faith and understanding and knowledge and relationship with you and your blessed Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.